So hello everyone and welcome to today's Anamet, Anamet Talk session. I am Aljan Kutlay and uh, I'm the production editor and publication specialist at Koch University Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations, also known as Anamet. Thank you for taking time out and being here today for the third talk of our new Anamet Talk series titled A Book Talk Glazed Wares as Cultural Agents in the Byzantine, Seljuk and Ottoman Lands. Our talk on the newly published volume focusing on medieval glazed ceramics will start with each speaker's 10 to 15 minutes talks on various topics of medieval ceramics and then will be followed by a Q&A session. You are more than welcome to write your questions into the chat box throughout the event and please do so. Before I leave the floor to today's speakers, I would like to briefly introduce them to you more formally. Filiz Yenişehirlioğlu is a professor of Ottoman art and architecture in the Department of Archaeology and History of Art at Koç University. She is also the director of the Vehbi Koç Ankara Studies Research Center in Ankara, also known as VEKA. She is a member of the International Executive Committee of Medieval and Modern Ceramics Association of the Mediterranean and a member of the National Committee of International Congress of Turkish Art. Her publications are on Ottoman cities, ceramics, architecture, and art. Recently, she worked on the development of a museum in the Byzantine period Tekfur Palace for the Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality. Beate Böhrendorf Arslan, who is going to join us soon, is a professor of Christian and Byzantine art and archaeology at Marburg University in Germany. After receiving her PhD in Heidelberg, with a study of glazed Byzantine pottery, for which she collected material in numerous excavations in Turkey, she was employed for nine years at Onsekiz Mart University in Çanakkale. Her research focuses on the daily life of the late Roman and Byzantine empires, based on archaeological excavations and field works in Turkey. This includes research in pottery, glass, all kinds of small finds, and architecture. She has published three books and several articles articles on Byzantine and Byzantine Ottoman transitional pottery, in addition to other works. And finally, Nikos Kontogiannis is an assistant professor of Byzantine archaeology and history of art at Koch University. His interests lie in the fields of military and domestic architecture, ceramics and minor objects, industrial production, and commercial networks in the Eastern Mediterranean. Having studied at the universities of Athens and Birmingham, he went on to work for 15 years at the Hellenic Ministry of Culture, at the Hellenic Ministry of Culture in Greece. His current projects focus on the study of two extensive late Byzantine hordes at the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Lastly, I would like to inform you that microphones and videos of all attendees are turned off and the event is being recorded. Welcome again, dear professors, and if you allow me, I would like to start with a general question concerning the book itself. I know it's difficult to explain or tell in such a short period of time, but could you please introduce us the book that was only published last month and its chapters, Professor Kontagianis? So thank you very much, Alichan. Thank you for all of you for uh, coming today, and we are going to <clears throat> try and speak about a little bit about our experience and our common uh, in working with this uh, book. And if I can share my screen, I think I can also put it on there. Yes. So my first part, the part where I'll be, where I'll be talking, I'll uh, focus mostly on uh, the book. And then um, my co-editors, Feliz and Beate, uh, will uh, cover more uh, general subjects. Now, for those of us who work on clay squares, and this is the uh, title of, uh, of the book, these are really happy times. Because the main thing I'm here to tell you is that the book we are presenting today is not a one-time event by people who came together by accident or fate, and then they continued their separate ways. This book came about by people who have been working together or concurrently for many years, and somehow managed to find answers to each other questions. Felice will speak later on about the international meetings that changed our field, 
and still produce the bulk of our research. But I only wanted to remind you th three such joyous occasions, which under the pandemic conditions seem even further in memory. The 2005 Congress in Chanakale that Beate had organized. And if you, you can see her here at the further left of, of the picture, the 2011 uh, meeting we had in Amsterdam, Fotini and uh, Beate, Fotini Condili and Ioannita Vrom had put together. And the 2016 uh, meeting we had in Lyon, amazingly hosting by Jona Baxman, uh, where uh, we shared with Elise and all the other people, one of the most enjoyable Byzantine banquets in memory. And you see Phyllis here at the center uh, of the picture. What people outside our circle see is only the result of these meetings, the collective volumes published diligently and methodically afterwards. And the same happens with the book we present today. For all those who participated in this publication, however, this is primarily a reminder of the joyous, creative, and fruitful meeting we had in Istanbul in December 2018. So we stand here as members of a community working on medieval and modern uh, pottery, one that is getting stronger and continuously advances. And every step, every publication along the way brings forth new ideas and opens new questions. This is how we, uh, we have come to this book, the product of interaction between older and more recent friends who all came together in Anamet for the 13th International Symposium on the 6th and 7th February, 7th December of 2018. Our work with Feliz and Beate had started almost a year earlier, when in multiple occasions, often in corridors between lessons, we were discussing what could our topic be? What could be an interesting angle, a new approach, the step forward in our field that would intrigue people to work and produce new evidence? Beate will speak more extensively about the current state of research, the contribution of our effort, and what glazed pottery can offer to the study of past societies. I would only like to say here that I believe that the main breakthrough of this book is to go beyond established labels and typologies, Byzantine, Mamluk, Seljuk, Ottoman, Fatimid. We look at the good quality pottery of the Eastern Mediterranean, which dominated markets for more than 10 centuries, from the 8th to the 19th centuries, from the viewpoint of the people who made, traded, and used them. Our traditional tool when we speak about these ceramics had always been their decoration, their shiny surface, embellished with various motifs that attract the attention and interest of the public. To these, we add the evidence from various archaeological studies, and thirdly, the data brought forth by technological and scientific research. These later are the things which are imperceptible to the human eye, yet important in order to understand the techniques and the choices made by the manufacturers, the secrets of the trade, if you will. We were fortunate that our proposal was accepted by Anamed and supported wholeheartedly both by the team of the Research Institute, as well as by the Department of Archaeology and History of Art at Koch University. All three of us, had organized similar events before, in which we literally had to take care of every last detail and face tons of adversities, from delayed planes to delayed caterers, to broken printers and non-functioning projectors. Well, this was not the case here, as far as I remember. I cannot thank enough the professional team of Anamed and all the people who supported and worked both for the symposium and the book publication. These are the fortunate events, events for, uh, and results when a well-functioning organization works collectively and when each contribution, however small, is respected and praised. We had invited 17 speakers, and I'm happy to say that they all accepted, presented their works, worked afterwards, and finally submitted their papers for the book. And as many of you 
uh, know this is another rarity when it comes to congresses. The symposium had five sessions apart from the opening and the closing remarks. And I think that the titles of the sessions are very indicative of what we hoped people would be inspired to explore both in the papers and in the discussion. Technology that travels brought together people who exploit the new technical possibilities in order to provide crucial data for interpreting ceramics. Ornament that travels grouped two papers dealing with fascinating cases of decorative motifs that speak of interactions, mobility, and acculturation. And information from three specific sites was presented in the session, local and imported pottery in archeological research. research. The center point of Anamed is obviously Anatolia. And therefore, in our final two sessions, we opened our scope and viewed Anatolia and the glazed ceramics in an almost global perspective. Three papers dealt with the relations with the Eastern Mediterranean and the Far East, which has always been an enigmatic, fascinating, and complicated subject from the earliest studies of medieval ceramics back in the late 19th century. The final session with four contributions concert, concentrated on the relations with the Eastern Mediterranean and Europe, with a date range from the Byzantine era down to the end of the 19th century. Now, I would like to add that the symposium and the book by no means exhaust any of the subjects mentioned above. We try to the best of our abilities to present an indicative sample of work that covers the widest possible geographical and chronological space. We hope that the reader will have a novel in refreshing overview of a material that played an important role in all historical communities. In the place of arbitrary geographies and divisions, we have embraced the glazed ceramics as a cultural ambassador of their times. Artifacts that speak directly about the everyday life of, of past societies, and at the same time, they reflect the conditions that these societies experienced. Thank you very much for this. And I will pass on uh, the, uh, the floor to Feliz. Thank you so and much. And to Alexan first. Thank you so much, Nikos. I was just taking some notes from your uh, mini presentation. And thank you so much for wrapping up in such a good way. So my next question to Feliz Ojadan. Uh, so um, as far as I understand, both from the publication and from your uh, presentation, Nikos, the international conferences on medieval ceramics are crucial conferences, congresses, they both. Uh, as a member of the International Executive Committee of Medieval and Modern Ceramic, Ceramics Association of the Mediterranean, dear Professor Yeni Şehirlioğlu, could you please give us some information about these international conferences and congress, their effects on academia, their integrative role, and so on. And I also appreciate if you can give brief information about Tekfur Palace, Tekfur Palace Museum and its current situation. <laughs> I guess you are muted, Filiz Ojan. Thank you, Ali Jan. Let me Thank first share my screen. Sure. Um, which is always, you know, uh, okay. uh, interesting to see if it works or not. So, okay, yeah. okay it's working. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Nikos, for this short but very precise introduction to the uh, book. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Nikos, who is in fact the initiator of this symposium and also uh, the editor who has really done a lot for the publication of this uh, uh, volume uh, together with Alijan. So he really is the um, force behind all the symposium and the publication itself. Now, um, uh, what I would like uh, uh, to start with is some uh, history. Um, glaze wares have always created enthusiasm, not only among collectors, but among everyone interested in ceramics. However, the research on glaze wares in Turkey was for a long time limited to the Ottoman period, and mainly to Izdik due to its popularity, and to Kütahya, since the production is still continued by local craftsmen. So, 
we uh, all know as um, uh, you know, scholars working on clay ceramics, uh, the different publications and the different books, both on Kutahya and on uh, Iznik productions, uh, as well as uh, recent productions, uh, always uh, depending on various uh, research by various Turkish uh, scholars. Uh, however, medieval period glasswares, mainly Byzantine, and to a certain degree even Selçuk, Italian, Spanish, Georgian, Armenian, Mongol, Ayyubid, Memluk, Crusaders were not object of research, mainly because lack of archaeological evidence. In fact, archaeological excavations targeted the classical periods in Turkey, and for a long time, the medieval layers were neglected. Thus, such objects lacked into museums, and this limited the development of scholarship on medieval period. The conception of archaeologists started to change, I think, after mid-1970s mainly, and they started to look for uh, experts working on the medieval period and its ceramics. Thus, Byzantine period ceramics started to get attention and European colleagues interest in Byzantine ceramics in Turkey also helped to develop the awareness on this later group. And to this effect, I would like to um, uh, pay um, my uh, deep uh, love and my appreciation first to Ebru Parman, who has started as a Turkish scholar working on Byzantine ceramics, and also uh, Veronique Francois and Yona Foxman, uh, who have uh, started to work and to uh, create uh, or initiate the awareness of Byzantine uh, ceramics in Turkey. So as Nikos has uh, showed, the first um, international Congress which in a way included both, um, uh, both uh, late antique Byzantine, Selçuk and Pottery uh, was the one that was uh, organized by Beate in Çanakkale in 2005. Uh, so this was a sort of a start uh, which made people uh, aware that in fact, uh, uh, you can find the continuation of certain techniques, you can find the continuation of certain motifs, and you can find this uh, transfer of techniques and uh, knowledge uh, among periods. So um, this was very important. And it also gave, of course, um, uh, a publication uh, as a special issue of the uh, uh, periodical. Uh, and as you see from the uh, program itself, you see the variety of uh, subjects, medieval subjects uh, that uh, was presented during this Congress. And some, of course, uh, social, uh, uh, I especially wanted to uh, show you this. Maybe you can recognize this young guy and also this young lady. <laughs> so that's up to you to decide who they are. Now, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, this sort of, you know, the, the Chanakkale meeting and then uh, the one that was uh, done in Amsterdam, uh, it was mainly focused on Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, whereas uh, in Western Mediterranean world, um, uh, scholars in France, Spain, Portugal, and Italy, they did come together earlier in 1978, but maybe about the same period really where medieval period uh, became into uh, focus uh, among scholars. And in the University of Aix-en-Provence and CNRS, uh, they uh, started to bring together in Valbonne, France, researchers uh, who at this time were uh, concerned uh, with the uh, Mediterranean pottery of the Western uh, Mediterranean. The success of this initiative within scientific circles uh, led firstly to guarantee the publication of the Congress minutes, which were transformed into a compulsory reference for researchers specialized in this area and to the creation of the International Association for the St uh, Study of Medieval Pottery in the Mediterranean, which was then called Association Internationale des Etudes de Céramique Médiévale uh, uh, 
uh, with the aim of promoting investigation and organization international congresses. Uh, so um, uh, these are the number of congresses that took place, international congresses. But what happened in Aix-en-Provence in 1995, Eastern Mediterranean was included also uh, within the general scope of the association. And from then on, uh, the other um, uh, congresses included also uh, subjects uh, from Eastern uh, Mediterranean. Uh, but uh, together with the Antalya conference, where uh, we also integrated uh, later modern periods, the association's uh, uh, sort of title changed from uh, to IESM 2 to IESM 3. So, um, uh, and the title became uh, Association Internationale des Études de Ceramique Médiévale et Moderne. Uh, thus, uh, uh, from then on, um, uh, late modern ceramic uh, researchers are also included. <clears throat> uh, the uh, last Congress was in Athens. Before that, it was Vecam uh, that organized it in Antalya in, uh, in 2015. And the next one will be in Granada in Spain uh, between 8 to 13 November this fall, I hope we can all go. Now, uh, to give you some information about the Antalya conference, because it was huge, and we had to publish uh, the proceedings in two volumes. Uh, and uh, the, uh, um, the, the strength with the broadening of the area of activity to include the Eastern Med Mediterranean, leading to the incorporation of researchers from a large number of countries helped to the um, number of people uh, who attended this conference. And when we say the Mediter Mediterranean world, of course, it's in the uh, concept of uh, Fernand Brodel's uh, concept of the Mediterranean. And it also includes the um, uh, hinterland of the Mediterranean world where uh, ceramic production uh, circulated. So to that respect, uh, Persia is included, Ira I mean, Iran is included, Crimea, Ukraine is included, and the northern um, uh, Black Sea region also is included. So what happens in these conferences, uh, congresses, is uh, the uh, international committee together with the local committee, they decide on certain themes. For example, in um, uh, Antalya, the, one of the the we had six themes. We had ceramics in wrecks and underwater discoveries because this was a uh, issue that was coming more and more popular, and also uh, uh, because the technologies developed and there were more underwater archaeology excavations, uh, the material we got from them was was getting compiled more and more. Uh, the second thing was architectural ceramics, since uh, uh, tiles were an important part of production of the Seljuk and uh, Ottoman periods. Uh, uh, the third thing was on kilns, workshops, and productions. Uh, this also uh, was important because, again, especially archaeometric analysis, uh, which uh, sort of increased in time, uh, helped us to determine the origin of the wares that we find during excavations. The fourth thing was, of course, pottery in Anatolia. And uh, of course, that is a large subject which we have to develop still uh, because we need to sort of, you know, separate uh, more carefully uh, what we find in uh, uh, the uh, eastern and northeastern uh, uh, regions of uh, Turkey where um, uh, intercultural encounters are uh, rather un, uh, un, uh, not unestimated, but uh, not researched as well as they are <clears throat> in western part of Turkey. <clears throat> the fifth theme uh, was on import and export, of course, that is uh, always fascinating uh, to find suddenly a completely anachronic object uh, somewhere that you don't think you will find. So it's always very interesting. I love these import exports. And of course, new discoveries 
<coughs> which are results of new research. Uh, to show you some examples, also social gatherings from Antalya. This is the group, the, the, we had it at the Ahmed premises in Antalya. Um, uh, and uh, we, here is the this hall where we had. And of course, these congresses always initiate uh, contacts among colleagues. And uh, that's why, you know, uh, information and knowledge is uh, shared between. Uh, the, uh, apart from the congresses, the association also organizes thematic uh, congresses. The first one was in Montpellier in 2014, uh, and the, it was called uh, the, these big jars, um, which is very interesting because um, uh, as you see here, um, uh, these uh, such big jars, uh, and uh, I mean, it's more than a jar, I don't know what to call it really, was used also as uh, uh, houses for uh, certain people. Uh, the second one was uh, in Faenza, it was about uh, the uh, pottery and community. Uh, so um, uh, new functions uh, of ceramics and how they uh, how they circulated in their community and what functions they had has been discussed. Uh, in the Congress in Athens, uh, we had decided to do some uh, thematic uh, workshops, but uh, it did not uh, unfortunately be realized. And in fact, I had asked one to do one in Istanbul uh, concerning how to exhibit ceramics, because that's always very problematic. Um, uh, the um, uh, archaeologists or they, they excavate the ceramics, uh, the ceramic uh, scholars, they uh, do research on them, but then they fill boxes and they rest in the deposit places uh, of the museums uh, or deposits of universities. Uh, so uh, museums and exhibitions, they prefer to have all these very nice and shiny plates and glazed wares. But in fact, um, we, I think, need to show uh, how ceramic is produced, what are the steps of it, and uh, various other information uh, concerning ceramics in a museum. And it shouldn't be only uh, the shiny glazed wares that's exhibited. Um, a lately very in a multidisciplinary approach to ceramics came, as Nikos has uh, mentioned, with the Pomedor project uh, by Yona Laksma. And uh, this also was an extremely interesting uh, multidisciplinary approach to food and food waste, uh, because it tried to understand uh, uh, if uh, uh, certain types of food could be uh, matched with certain types of pottery and uh, what type of food was uh, cooked in what type of pottery and uh, how it was served and all the other different types of um, uh, details concerning uh, food and pottery as well. So uh, the volume um, uh, includes, um, as you see, uh, researchers based on archaeobotany, zoology, anthropology, uh, and uh, other uh, different uh, areas. Uh, and uh, as Nikos has mentioned, the nice part of it was that we had a, a Byzantine uh, dinner. Um, uh, this was in 2015 or 16, I think. Uh, but of course, uh, when you look at the layout, it's not much different than a big feast that the Ottoman Pasha gave <laughs> to his um, <coughs> invite to, 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 to the other Pashas and uh, guests, uh, where we have a very large table with lots of plates, the same thing, uh, and uh, the uh, people, the ones who are serving, waiting at the back of the guests. So I thought this would be amusing uh, to make the difference that in fact, uh, of course, human behavior <coughs> do not change much. So the inputs uh, to the field of these uh, uh, <coughs> congresses, I think are very important because it not only creates contacts among colleagues, 
but it's, it of course, uh, it's the dissemination of new information that we get from them. It's the creation of new themes for research according to local um, organizers and uh, local uh, um, research areas. It helps to develop research depending on skills, functions, and consummation of ceramics. It helps to understand the artistic tastes and the ways it circulates within the Mediterranean region. It contributes uh, to the understanding that, in fact, there is no other, as Nikos has tried to show us, but there is similar or common sources of creativity and practicality in human behavior. And of course, producing glaze wares is an ongoing process and historical research innovates new ways of creativity and experiences uh, for contemporary uh, ceramic producers uh, and glaze wares and uh, potters. So uh, thank you very much. I hope I had summarized uh, what uh, the association is doing and yeah. how it helps uh, with the development of um, uh, ceramic research, uh, especially around the Mediterranean area. Now, coming back uh, to your last question, I would like to give a very short answer. Um, uh, the Tekvur Palace, uh, which is, of course, a, um, uh, the, the, the way it is now uh, sort of uh, used, the, the part that is used is from the uh, 14th century. Uh, and um, uh, in the 18th century, uh, Ottoman kilns uh, uh, were uh, placed there in order to produce similar uh, tiles to Iznik production. Um, so I did an excavation there in the 1990s. And uh, then, of course, as I've uh, mentioned before, uh, all the shirts and the objects I have found uh, were in the museum deposit places of the Turkish and Islamic Art Museum. Then the, um, the, the uh, Istanbul municipality, the greater municipality, decided to uh, make a museum of the site and had it restored. Uh, so um, uh, the question was what to put in this site. <laughs> uh, could it be a Byzantine museum? Uh, yes, of course, it would have been lovely to have a Byzantine museum in that uh, building because it's the only one that survived with it uh, still with its four walls, um, but uh, of course, what to put in it? And then the municipality, you know, uh, 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 could not uh, spend, I guess, that much money in trying to find all the different uh, objects, uh, maybe dispersed from Istanbul to other museums or collectors around the world. Um, but of course, it would be lovely to make such an exhibition in that area. Uh, so um, uh, the, the easiest thing, of course, was to make use of the uh, shirts that uh, were excavated uh, from the uh, Tekfur Palace kilns, because we had found two kilns uh, and lots of substitute mules and uh, shirts and other objects. So um, uh, I was asked to contribute, and together with Sumerata Soy, uh, we organized the, organiz the, the exhibition um, with quite a lot of uh, uh, interactive uh, technical uh, sort of programs as well. And now it's an open museum, uh, uh, depending on the Istanbul municipality. And uh, the objects that we got from Turkish Islamic Art Museum, from Istanbul Archaeological Museum, and from Istanbul Municipal Museum, which does not exist anymore, um, uh, they are all exhibited there. I mean, they are um, uh, on loan for a certain period because the state, uh, the, state uh, the um, uh, Ministry of Culture, uh, only loans objects, they don't just give it. So they are on loan for a special uh, period of time that can be renewable, of course. And the museum functions quite well, interestingly, because we thought it should also be a, muse a neighborhood museum. Uh, so um, uh, the director also, um, uh, she's very, very active, uh, especially before the pandemic. Um, uh, lots of school children, 
and also um, uh, people living around in the country, in the, in the neighborhood, they do come and uh, visit uh, the site. Uh, and also they use the courtyard as a place to have uh, uh, concerts. Uh, they had Byzantine concerts, uh, nights and other uh, activities uh, using the courtyard. So uh, there are certain things to correct, I have to admit, because uh, uh, this was uh, not the actual uh, greater municipality who opened the, the, the museum, it's the, 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 the other one. And they were in a hurry because we were going to have the municipal elections. Uh, so uh, certain things, you know, certain details uh, uh, have to be corrected. So if you visit, Please do not think that it's our mistake, but <laughs> it, it, those mistakes have unfortunately not been yet corrected, but they are not many. And the general public enjoys it because uh, there are a lot of interactive uh, programs, both children and grown-ups. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Filiz Hocam. And Professor Böhlendorf Arslan, welcome. And I know that you had some connection problems. So let me summarize very quickly for you for, uh, I mean, what we talked uh, until this point. Uh, Professor Kontogiannis briefly introduced us the book and Professor Yeni Şehirlioğlu uh, talked about international conferences, congresses, their uh, importance. And also I'm sure you heard the Tech for Palace Museum. And, so now uh, I'm going to welcome you with a question, if it is okay for you. But before asking a question to you, I would like to let everyone know that please feel free to ask your questions throughout the event to the chat box uh, section of the uh, Zoom window. And, and Filiz Hocam, thank you one more time uh, for your presentation and especially for the visuals. <laughs> so my next question to uh, Professor Böhlendorf Arslan, I mean, I know each one of you can talk hours uh, while answering this question, but I still would like to ask and I appreciate if you can answer it. Uh, Actually, please was a little bit mentioned, but still, I'm going to ask. What do the glazed potteries can tell us about the daily life and everyday life, Professor Bogdanov Arslan? So, thank you for this question and hello to everybody. Sorry for uh, my circumstances. It's a little bit funny in Germany with the universities, and but now I'm here. Um, for uh, the answer of this question, I want to share my screen. So hopefully this works. Uh, I think you show now, you see now my screen? Yes. I okay. Do. Then, uh, so um, what can Glaze Pottery tell us? It's really no simple answer to this question. Mm -hmm. uh, the technique of glazing is thousand years old. Glaze had not only an aesthetic function, often it also ser served to make the vessels waterproof. And as functional as glaze is, glazed pottery was a product of highly artistic craftsmanship. Therefore, it is no surprising that in the Middle Evil East, the use of clays become commonplace for quality ceramics in both the Islamic and Byzantine world. Manufacturing and firing techniques were always the outcome of a mindful process, including experiments with clay recipes, import and use of new materials, as well as the adoption and change of glazing techniques. Consistency, and change could indicate the extension of a pottery workshop, influence, and socio-ethnic continuity over geographical or temporal borders. The glazed pottery is always a product of its time. The workshop make their products in the context of their neighborhood and surroundings. Customers buy the goods not only according to their financial situation, but also reflect the spirit of their times. Pottery, like other kinds of material culture, is subject to fashion. The glazed pottery is also a medium of carrying images. The ornaments connected the aesthetic feeling of the pottery makers and the users, and their influence was shared and communicated through the trade with the decorated pottery. 
but the iconography of the decoration on the pottery goes beyond of only being an ornamentation. With the imagery, the motifs on the pottery are more than a simple decoration. They possess a visual language that the people of that time understood and that we have to decode today. Glazed ceramics are used as indicators of a social status of their owner. For this reason, when buying a tableware, people certainly paid attention to appearance and quality. Guests at the dinners and the celebrations could recognize the value of the tableware and they knew the symbolism of the decorative motifs. Glazed pottery in various form first made its appearance in the Eastern Mediterranean already in the seventh century. Observing what came after this first, first appearance of glazed pottery through the scope of wares, individual productions occur in specific places, times and socioeconomic conditions for each of which we try to discern its geographic distribution and the people involved in the process. I would like to present now our four case studies, the group of pottery, which were identified based on their common decoration and techniques, and which were analyzed from different viewpoints. The close examination and continuous studies of these four groups has produced new information and has shined light on historical realities that would have otherwise been left hypothetical. Glazed pottery made of a light white cream to beige kaolin clay known widely as white ware was first classified in 1930 by David Talbot Rice and afterwards by Charles Morgan on the pottery of Corinth on account of his characteristic decorative patterns using impressed stain stamped motifs. It was later on identified in numerous variations and dated from the seventh century onwards. It included different shapes and glazed qualities, first under decorated and with a simple incis decoration, then from the on century, century onwards with impressed motifs on the interior of open vessels. The white wares were therefore not a closed homogeneous production and this caused John Hayes in his famous Istanbul Saracana publication of 1992 to divide them into four classes. This production gave impetus to red clay variants of the same time frame, such as those produ produced in Amorium in Inner Anatolia. White wares were produced in various workshops. They are largely divided between those coming from Constantinople and those from Breslav in Bulgaria, indicating diverse geopolitical connotations. A second group of incised ceramics whose study has greatly advanced over the recent years fall under the generic name of Xoxippos. This pottery was first identified in the excavation of the Bath of Xerxippus in Istanbul by David Talbot Rice in 1928. And therefore, this distinctive high quality clay ware has long been considered as a typical Constantinopolitan trademark. In 1968, uh, yeah, 86, sorry, Arthur McGuff attributed it to the late 12th and early 13th century and distinguished two classes. More recent discoveries have demonstrated that wares with similar features were produced also in Western Asia Minor, Trace and perhaps Crimea. At the same time, many scholars in multiple locations were discovering mainly bowls with similar decoration of incised circles. There are sting dis distant similarities to Xoxippus and the simultaneous realization of the differences earned them to a variety of terms, such as Xerxippus family, imitation, derivates, or subtypes. 
It is only through continuous research that a distinct image gradually emerged. Similarly decorated objects, also tentatively called scraffiti with concentric circles, were independently produced by workshops scattered all the way from North Italy to the Aegean and Black Sea, dating from the middle of the 13th century onwards. Combining data with the particular historical conditions of this period can actually lead to the potential interpretations of this distinguished phenomenon once the Mongol Empire was created and a silk route shifted from the Levant to the Black Sea, the primary rule of this maritime area in a global commerce was eventually reflected in the ceramic production. Local workshops catering and responding to the international, mainly Italian fleets, continuously on the move were eventually producing homogenous products responding to their patrons' demands. This interaction between clay's productions and global commercial networks is especially true for the later centuries. This trading activity was almost never unilateral. While Ottoman ceramics were exported to the West, glazed wares from Italy easily found their way to the Ottoman Empire. A good example to this movement is the very distinct Albi Solar ware produced in Liguria in Italia from the 15th to the 18th century. Especially in the 18th century, this pottery became so popular that, is, that it was massively exported throughout the Ottoman Mediterranean. Many finds came from seaside locations, but also from ship rigs, indicating the nautical routes followed. The vessels were probably sold on the Istanbul markets and on its return home, it would possibly carry, carry the, in, in exchange other highly successful Turkish products such as Kütahya or Çanakkale wares. The fourth case includes pottery that has decorations imitating marble. This kind of ordinary low cost pottery appear in Roman Gaul, Tang China, Renaissance Italy, colonial America, Victorian England, Ottoman Empire, or can contemporary workshops and was firmed usually under various names such as marble, xiao tai, mixed slipped or agate ware. The basic decorative attribute of the marble wares is their colorful surface. The extremely popular Ottoman marble wares was, as Scott Redford has already noted, influenced by the famous Ebru technique. The Ebru marbling technique was a distinctive high quality product of Ottoman craftsmanship. To summarize, glazed pottery can reconstruct networks of interaction between regions and people and serve as a cultural agent and social indicators in the Byzantine, Seljuk and Ottoman lands. Our volume may not be able to give a straightforward answer on what can glazed pottery tell us. Its immense contribution lies on the fact that it illuminates the various aspects of this complex issue. I have no doubt that this publication will serve as a key reference in the study of medieval glazed ceramics through the, uh, the, its result and the questions that put forth. It goes without saying that with every excavation comes new pottery. With every scientific analysis of ceramics, more data are added. I'm already look forward to the next conferences with further stimulating lectures in Granada or a continuation of Chanak in the third in a third symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bohdan Parsan. And we are sorry that uh, we made you answer the question as soon as you came to the uh, webinar. 
So before we move into the Q&A session, I would like to ask a few uh, short questions to all of you. And of course, the very first one is about the uh, about the book itself. By the way, I would like to remind everyone one more time that uh, the English version of the publication uh, was published in uh, mid-February 2021. And the Turkish version of the publication will be out in May 2021. And so my question is, uh, by the way, this is the book itself. Uh, how was it making a publication during uh, such a period? I mean, you know which period I'm talking about, because I mean, uh, we kind of started doing it in the last one year. And what were the difficulties? Were there any advantages of doing a publication from three or four or even five different places? I appreciate if you can answer this question. Normally the internet works. This is it was not a problem <laughs> up to now, I think. <laughs> sure. Nikos, would you like it's to start true. and then forward yes. the question yes. to Fiz Oja and Beata? Yeah. Which... Yes, it was very peculiar <laughs> to work from such a long distance. But it's true that when you have a good collaboration with all the people, then all these problems mm -hmm. uh, work uh, also very easily. Um, it's true that with the uh, comings and goings and all the friends were always uh, on time and working on their material. So we, uh, we found other ways to cope with this, uh, with the pandemic period. And I think it worked very quickly also because we all wanted this to be out. That's also very important thing. It is our job. Uh, Beato Ojan, would you like to add anything? Myself. Well, I agree with Nikos, of course. And the way we work is, of course, you know, we separated the work between three of us. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, uh, uh, each of us read a certain number of articles that we were sort of more acquainted with the subject and tried to give our ideas and impressions to the writers. Um, and then they were very quick in responding. So, you know, the, the corrections were done uh, very quickly um, and it worked quite smoothly. Uh, so I would like to thank all the contributors for their effort uh, to make this publication a success. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Professor Bohlandorf Arstan, would you like to add anything? I think the same. It was like an, an, an tennis match. So uh, <laughs> we have a ping pong with the answer and question. And yeah. but uh, also I, I tend to Phyllis Monimitz. Uh, uh, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, yeah input uh, also to uh, from the coach, um, from the uh, from from the layer layouters and so on, and from yourself. So I think without this network, um, uh, it didn't become so quickly. So thank you to all of, our, of you. Thank you. Yes, and also to mention also Lorene and Denise Ever and uh, Lorene Davis who also did the um, copy editing and the translation from different terms. It was always uh, interesting to see how, you know, putting the, some terminology from one language to another, it also creates uh, discussions, to say the least. And also designer Burak Shushut. Uh, because, I mean, because you will remember, we sat several times in different sessions to make this uh, public. He has a lot of patience, that's <laughs> for sure. I agree, I agree. Thank you so much for the answer. So I will keep on asking some questions. And Nikos, I appreciate if you can forward the question to the right person, either you can answer it, you can either uh, forward it to Professor Yeni Şehegel or Böhlendorf Arslan. Uh, I... I both read in one of the articles in the publication and also during the uh, Professor Ian Shehdol's uh, presentation, uh, you are mentioning uh, you are mentioning a conference that took place in 1999 in Thessaloniki, and you name it as one of the first international conference or one of the first international congress on, uh, let's say, medieval ceramics. So what has changed since 1999 Thessaloniki uh, conference to today? Of course, in terms of uh, the approaches and in terms of the technological advancements in the research. 
I don't know, we were, I think we were all free there. So Beate or Felice, you were not Felice. No, it was not more. more. No, I was, I was before that at the, uh, the French school uh, in Athens who all- Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But this was the first one. I yeah, yeah, first one. The French. That's why I'm asking. What yes, has you're right, that? in 85. <laughs> Yes. 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 The one in eighty-five. I see. The one I can. I, the, the the image that I have is that I was going around with the photos. We had to remember the printed photos, and in Thessaloniki, I was going around in the different rooms asking people, "Have you seen this before? Have you seen this before?" Because we had a lot of ceramics that we didn't know about it, and I remember that that's how I met Edna Stern and. Uh, uh, Joanita, because they were in a different room and they were showing some other photos and they looked like something that I knew and it was a Spanish lusterware, which we only had in our excavation and obviously there are in many others, but I've never seen them before anywhere else. And they were discussing about it and I went there and I told them, you, you have the same things, so do we. So I think in these years we have gone a long way from just recognizing some pottery to understanding how this pottery functioned, how it was being traded, how it was um, uh, produced, and uh, uh, how it passed from so simply something that we have to being uh, a commodity and the, the, the social effects that it had. How, what is the whole network behind this ceramic? Not just as an object, but as a, a social uh, effect. So as a social product, what is the network of the people who produce it, the people who trade it, and actually the people who will use it in another in another area? And I think that's the big change that I've seen. Thank you so and much. You. Yes, and also I think at this year's we made we made the basics, and now we are a step over the basics. So uh, it is a really a, continu a continuity of, of these basic things. Now we have the words, we have the chronology more or less, and now we can speak about the agents. Yes. And uh, before we were speaking as generally, Byzantine mm -hmm. wares or Byzantine ceramics, now we have so much more material on courseware. That's the new type that we, we tended to neglect it totally. But then we have the amphorae. We've done so much work. Many people have done when we say we, all the people who are working. So now we know much more about this and they tend to be separate sections. As Felice said in the latest, uh, um, these meetings, we have whole sections on specific types of ceramics, which didn't happen before. Uh, and also, you know, it's uh, not anymore what we would call pots and pans. <laughs> There's much more to it now. You know, it, it used to be called pots and pans. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a whole social and cultural background that uh, we are looking at and that we are trying to understand. Uh, so in that way, I think it's very, very uh, interesting. Um, to consider this uh, the ceramic production as uh, elements of material culture that tell a lot about economics, uh, that tell a lot about trade, that tell a lot about taste um, and uh, network organizations. And uh, I think they, um, they, they speak on themselves really, and uh, they are um, uh, visually um, according to me as an art historian, of course, are much more important than archival material, I have to admit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, and, and from the time also of uh, the Chanakale uh, conference, we see them also more as um, archaeological artifacts. So we are having archaeological uh, strata and at last we can use them in order to date other things. So. The next step was not only to understand the basic um, groups, the, the highlights, like is neat, but also the ones that were used next to it, the most uh, um, everyday 
uh, ceramics that people were using that perhaps were not were locally made and were not uh, such commodities or traveling so much. So we have a long way ahead of us, but it is, uh, uh, you know, we are running, I think. Thank you so much. There is a very specific question. Uh, uh, both Professor Yin Shehilo and Behlendorf Arslan talked about uh, what do the glazed ceramics tell us about eating habits and food waste, etc. But the consumption of tea and coffee, did it affect the production of uh, especially glazed ceramics uh, 16th and 17th century onwards? Well, of course not. Uh, tea is very late. Yeah. <laughs> tea is 19th century, really, in the Ottoman world. Mm -hmm. But uh, coffee is earlier. Coffee is earlier. Coffee is earlier. And uh, I, I um, uh, to get, uh, together with um, the, the editing of uh, uh, Janita Vroom and Jona uh, uh, Waxman, they did this book, Medieval Masterchef which was the proceedings of the, uh, inter uh, the International Archaeological European Conference. And there I sort of, you know, talked about uh, the uh, coffee cups and how um, at the beginning, in fact, there were no coffee cups. Mm -hmm. It was sort of small casse, the, the sort of the Chinese type of little cups that were used to drink the coffee. And the type of coffee uh, cups that we started to have are quite late, and especially the one with the little handle, it starts only in the 18th century. Um, and uh, so um, uh, coffee consumption, of course, uh, influence uh, the uh, making of uh, new types of cups, but quite late. Um, uh, I mean, in Europe also, uh, it was first used both for tea and coffee, and then it started to become more specialized. Uh, the more bourgeois you get, the more different you start to have coffee cups. So it, it, it is a social phenomenon. I mean, when we, when we study uh, material culture, uh, somehow we uh, generally forget to look at social classes and what types uh, those uh, members of what specific social class used what. <laughs> so in a way, because we sort of, you know, um, evaluate the objects that we see in museums, which are of course uh, deconstructed from their um, uh, milieu of production and function, um, uh, it's uh, sometimes, you know, it just, uh, we just looked at general um, uh, connections, uh, whereas uh, we need to look at more specific uh, connections. And there, of course, we need archival material, even though I said earlier that, you know, uh, visuality is much more important. But there, of course, for example, the, uh, for the Ottoman period, when we look at the uh, meaning the inheritance books, of the uh, of the Ottoman uh, Ottomans, because when they die, they have this notebook where the Akkad, you know, registers what um, uh, different types of uh, uh, money, carpets, whatever they had. Uh, so uh, when you analyze those according to certain social groups, uh, then you understand what type of pottery also they used. Uh, so I think that's also very interesting uh, to see. Thank you so much, Kizlacan. And uh, now I have a question, but I, I assume Beate Hoca, Professor Böhlendorf Arslan can answer it. Actually, I mean, it, the response to this question can take another hour, but I will uh, ask it uh, nonetheless. Uh, why Iznik wares became so popular in the West and are they still popular in the West? Oh, it's not a question for me. It's a question to Phyllis Hodja, I think, but uh, I, I can answer it as well. Yeah. So 
um, I think it's a, it's a kind of orientalism in in what it was in the Western and in, in in Europe. So they they want to have this kind of Ottoman thing. It's not only the poetry, but the poetry is a kind of these wares. It is uh, there are also the metal wares and so on. And this is this this kind of fashion who creates in in the time of of a Renaissance and who is also seen in in other kind of of uh, material. And therefore, also the, uh, the Isnik wares and also the Kitachia wares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But maybe Phyllis Hocha want to add something. Yeah, that would be great. Well, of course, I wrote about it in the beginning of the book, how yeah. uh, you know, uh, um, is, uh, Isnik style um, has been constant <laughs> since the 16th century. And it, it is quite interesting because, um, uh, for example, you don't have uh, the influence of Baroque in Isnik style. You don't have the influence of Art Nouveau in Isnik style. Isnik style is Isnik style as it yeah. has been defined in the 16th century and it, it continued uh, uh, since our days. And uh, I, found, I, I found that uh, really uh, interesting um, so, um, of course, the, the reason why it was um, uh, first uh, imitated in the West is um, in Italy, um, what happened, of course, uh, both carpets and uh, ceramics coming from the East were, were very, very expensive. So it was only the, the aristocracy and the feudal princes and the churches that could buy it. Uh, but of course, um, uh, you know, middle classes also would like to have it. So how do you democratize a production? You imitate it. <laughs> yes, exactly. so I think that's how it started. And uh, the, the Venetians and especially the Italians, uh, of course, they are um, extremely, um, uh, you know, um, in trade, they are very successful. Uh, so um, uh, they could reproduce, imitate and then sell it back. Uh, to the uh, same country from the, where they cut, uh, where they imitated the objects. So they were, you know, excellent about this. Um, so I think that's how it started in, 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 the, in, in, in Italy, first of all. Um, and the, uh, they uh, also uh, then when the potters from Italy moved to the, uh, to Central Europe and to Western Europe, they um, brought with them the same technique and the style, not the technique, but the style. And it seems to uh, sort of, you know, been accepted uh, as maybe a fantasy, maybe because of its beauty. Oh. Uh, I mean, natural flowers uh, always attract attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, people love it. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, in order to have abstract geometrical motives, um, you know, people love uh, flowers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, it's interesting, for example, a, a research has been done, what kind of painting uh, uh, is appreciated in the world in, in art history, and uh, especially among middle classes, and it's impressionism. They found out that it's impressionism that is much more appreciated among the middle classes all around the world. So in a way, Isnik style seems to be appreciated uh, by everyone. And I was, I was shocked last year before the pandemic when I was in Cambridge where my daughter lives and we went to this pub and uh, around the uh, cheminée, mm -hmm. there was this blue and white uh, 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 Ottoman uh, uh, Isnik style uh, tiles that were reproduced because uh, it, it's a variety and it was uh, contemporary production, contemporary production. And also, for example, um, the uh, traders in, again, in, uh, in, in the UK, they have asked the Chinese to produce Isnik style plates that they sell in vantage houses. So, <laughs> you know, um, ceramics is, uh, is, is something quite uh, extraordinary. If you start to follow them, uh, you can go to the other side of the world, really, for, and make a, you know, a round trip, maybe not in 80 days, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Thank you so much, Biz Hocam. Uh, there are questions coming uh, about the book itself. Where can we find it? Uh, the book, the English version of the book is out and uh, they are available in the Kochimers Press bookstores and Yapu Kredi Yayınları bookstores. But also the Turkish version of it, uh, Turkish version of the publication will be published in May. I just wanted to let you know one more time because there are several questions coming about the publication and I wanted to interrupt you. And I have uh, actually, Filiz Hocam, I am sorry, but I might make you to talk more because uh, speaking, this is my question, the speaking of imitation uh, in your article in the publication, you are interviewing with Rufat Usta, or let's say Master Rufat, or Rufat Master, in 1993. And he says that imitation is an essential factor in my production, he says. How important was the imitation during the medieval period in terms of pottery production? You are uh, unmute yourself. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I don't know about the medieval period. I have to admit, <laughs> my uh, uh, my uh, subject and uh, my my knowledge generally starts from sort of, you know, 14th century onwards, how medieval is 14th century, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, if, if we look at Iznik production, of course, there was the imitation of Chinese porcelain um, at the end of the 15th century and beginning of the 16th century. So um, uh, uh, this was imitation. Um, and I have to admit it, but uh, maybe for the medieval periods, because and Beate they can say I, can't say. I was going to come. Oh, I think that always uh, ceramic is being accused of uh, of being an imitation. So yes, <laughs> uh, also for the for every time you uh, we can find a way to you know another another more expensive material object that uh, looks like it and perhaps. Uh, ceramic is imitating it, like the white wares, perhaps they were coming from the silverware of the period. And even these uh, relief uh, motifs could also be um, taking after the embossed uh, techniques. Uh, I believe that, uh, yes, uh, imitation, but also creative imitation. That means they, were, they all lived in the same environment. Many times, and that is the interesting thing, uh, some of the motifs are out there. They can be in uh, carpets, they can be in books. They are part of the artistic of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, motifs that people are sharing. So uh, uh, all these people, um, they are not just copying blindly. I believe they are adapting uh, the creative and the artistic. Uh, um, spirit of their times. That's what I would suggest. Yes, I, th I think the same, but we have also um, motifs on the pottery we have ne never seen on, on other materials, like the, uh, so the Digenis Akritsias motif yes. or so on. Mm. So uh, the pottery is aware from, uh, yeah, from, from normal people as well. And not only of, of, of high uh, valued people. So we have also uh, to see this, I think. They copied, yes, but not only. They have also new things with this poetry. Yes, and many times also the motives are something like the, the, the trademarks of uh, many of the workshops. It's yeah. like the same thing with the flowers of a, of a snake. Sometimes we, we say the same for the rabbit of the 12th century. We have, you ha we have the, a workshop that has only these uh, Chanleve rabbits and we see them everywhere. And we're trying to understand why they are using it. And it's an interesting um, uh, hunt for finding uh, uh, new interpretations for this. And it shows how much more we need to learn on many layers. Thank, Thank you so much. So it looks like we've covered all of our questions. Dear professors, is there anything else you want to cover before a wrap up? 
I see. No. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for this great talk, Professor Yenish Teodor, Professor Berlandorf Arsan, and Professor Konto Gens. And one more time, I would like to thank to all the contributors and all the uh, all people who contributed to the book, including the translator, translators, copy editor, and designer of the publication. And I would like to also thank to our attendees for joining us for their uh, interesting questions and for their uh, remarks. And before I uh, wrap up, please do follow Anamet's social media accounts and our website or subscribe to our mailing list for the upcoming Alamed events and activities. Have a good rest of the day or evening. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.